So um, what I want to talk about today is a little bit about what Pressbooks is. So this is our founder, Hugh McGuire. Pressbooks is a Canadian company. They're based in Montreal. Um, and Pressbooks is an online book publishing platform that makes it easy for people to generate clean, well-formatted books in multiple outputs. Pressbooks is built on top of WordPress, which is a common uh, blog and website publishing tool. And Pressbooks itself is open source software. And that means that anyone who wants to can inspect the source, can contribute to the project, can install Pressbooks themselves on a server that they have access to or they control, um, and can um, make suggestions or contributions. There's a large kind of robust community of people who talk about Pressbooks, who use Pressbooks, and increasingly a number of uh, educational institutions that contract with us to host institutional networks for them. So that's kind of what Pressbooks is. In the kind of more specific case, Pressbooks is many different networks. So there are dozens of installations of Pressbooks. And each individual installation of Pressbooks is itself a large, what's called multi-site network. So here I'm showing a screenshot of the eCampus Ontario instance or network of Pressbooks. This is the landing page here. You can see it's branded to be this Pressbooks Open Library. It describes here at the top for you what it is. There's a button that you can request an account. I think Lillian's standing by on this call for anyone who'd like an account or is inspired to try this out. She can create those accounts for people as a network manager. And then it invites people to customize or create books to get started or to search the eCampus Ontario catalog of hundreds of openly licensed educational resources here. So there are dozens of these networks that exist as individual Pressbook networks. Each network itself can contain hundreds or thousands of individual books. So you can create your own book or you can create multiple books. Every book on the Pressbooks network, on a Pressbooks, on a Pressbooks network will have its own homepage or its own landing page. They have their, a unique place that they live on the web. Each book could have a different structure from another book. It could have a different theme, so it could look different. It could have different colors and have a different typefaces. It also can be published under its own license. So uh, we want authors or creators to decide how they'd like to license their material. We're talking this week a lot about open education, so that means usually the Creative Commons licenses. But authors can retain all rights reserved to their material on Pressbooks, that's fine as well. Authors ultimately can decide how they want to license their work. Um, and a book can have different permissions um, from another book on the network. The homepage for a book I want to explain will include a number of things. Here you're seeing the title of a book, you're seeing a list of contributors, you're seeing a brief description. Here you're seeing the particular license that the book was licensed under. This one is CCBYNCSA. There's a lot of acronyms there, but someone locally can help you understand the Creative Commons licenses if you'd like to understand those more. You'll see the ability to read the book, the ability to share it on social media, a table of contents down here, a cover image that you could create and upload or use our cover generator tool to make your own. And then this book has enabled, because it's an open book, they've enabled public downloads. So while the book exists as a web book, Visitors to this book could also download the book in a variety of offline formats, container formats, EPUB 3, EPUB, PDFs for digital, PDFs for print, or a Mobi file, which you could read on a Kindle. We support, I believe, 10 or 11 different export formats, and you can make those easily from a Pressbooks title. What's not pictured down here is a lot more metadata, though librarians especially would be interested. We present and allow users to to provide a wide variety of metadata or information about a book that can be displayed on the book's homepage. Inside of a book, you'll see we have a nice kind of reading interface for the web book. There's a large table of contents here. This was a Canadian history book that I found on the uh, eCampus Ontario Open Library. And here's an example of a chapter. Here'd be the title, a couple of paragraphs, um, a heading, and then below you, there'd be more content of various types. That's how it looks in the web book. Oops, I went too, a little too fast. And over on the right-hand side, I'm showing you an example of the new export screen. So uh, an author, when the book is ready, could decide they want to produce exports in any or all of these formats. They'd click export the book. It would produce a series of exports. And you could see um, a series of recent exports that can be sorted by format, size, date exported. 
we're now gonna allow people to pin those exports, which would save them. Um, so if you had a nice stable version of the book that you'd exported and you were producing new ones to test how they look like, the new ones wouldn't override or replace the, the old ones. So we support a wide variety of exports um, as well as the web book viewing, um, largely because it's really important if we're thinking about open education to provide access to people wherever they're at. Not everyone has reliable internet access. We know there's a large digital divide. And so many people would like their books in print or would like them on in container formats that they could access when they don't have reliable internet. And that's possible here with Pressbooks. The other thing I want to show quickly is the editing interface. Any of you who have used WordPress will probably be familiar with what looks like a pretty basic WYSIWYG editor. We think that editing a Pressbooks title is about as easy as learning to use a word processor. Many of these buttons will be familiar to word processor users. There's a few other kind of custom features that have been added that can take a little bit of training, but they're usually all available here in this kind of visual interface. This is an example of a book that has an image and a description and then some uh, content below. You'll see a bunch of different options and choices for publishing up at the top right. Um, the other thing to note about a Pressbooks book is within each book, permissions are granular. So you can grant different collaborators various permissions in a single title. You can have a book administrator who has kind of godlike permissions for that book. You can have book editors, book authors, uh, book contributors, and even book subscribers, which can read a private book but can't actually edit or author anything. And those, can, those, those permissions are different from book to book. So for, so for example, Lillian could be a book administrator in one book, a book editor in a second book, and a book contributor in a third book. And we describe what those permissions are and how they work in an authoring guide that's linked from this, this slide. The other thing that Pressbooks makes a bit easier than most tools is the ability to display and organize your content on the back end. So here we're looking at a sample table of contents. This is a drag and drop interface. If I wanted to, this isn't a live preview, but I could take this chapter and move it up here, or I could move it down there. This here is a part or a section. This is another part or a section. And chapters can be moved between parts and sections. We also allow people to create what we call front matter and back matter. These would be organized preface and, and appendix type materials. There's a number of front matter and back matter types that we support, and they'll be organized and structured in a way that is most appropriate for the style of your book. Um, you'll also see from this interface, you can assign individual authors for parts and chapters. If you have an edited collection, you can give each author an individual, or each chapter individual author credit. And you can also, at a glance, exclude or include chapters from the web book and include or exclude from the exports. What this allows you to do is to say, hey, this content will be available in our print PDF book, but not available in the public web book for whatever reason, or vice versa. So it's a nice quick at a glance you can choose whether content is part of the web book or not, or part of the export or not. I wanna talk a little bit about some common uses for Pressbooks, and this is something that's close to my heart. Um, I've worked on projects in each of these categories and people at your institution or eCampus Ontario certainly have done the same. The most common use, I think, and the reason we're talking about it this week is that Pressbooks can be used to, re to replace expensive proprietary textbooks. There really is a crisis in the cost of textbooks. Many of you have read about this. This may be what drew you to open education. Um, and Pressbooks um, can be used to build free and openly licensed replacements for any of those proprietary expensive texts. Um, it's most impactful in high enrollment courses, but it can be used in any course in any educational setting. The other thing that Pressbooks is, can be done is it can produce a remixed or a localized or a, an improved or an adapted version of existing OER. And I'll talk a bit more about that later in the presentation. I think there's broad uses in training, in outreach, and in distance education. We've seen people make uh, manuals, training manuals, sometimes for education and sometimes for some program that they're running. Building guides to using Pressbooks or guides to technology or guides to anything really. Um, you have a handbook that you've used or distributed in your department for graduate assistants or for undergrads. 
those are kind of easy publishing projects that can be done in Pressbooks. And sometimes we've even seen people do course teasers. So for example, at Wisconsin, we have a Wisconsin extension program that teaches a bunch of distance training courses. One of them's about Wisconsin weather. Everybody loves to talk about the weather, especially when it's bad. And so they have a, you know, an adult continuing education course about Wisconsin weather. They took the first three modules from that course and they put it in a free press books to give people a taste for what the course is about. And then if people like that and want to know more, they could enroll and sign up for the distance course and have, you know, an instructor lead them through with a group of peers to talk about Wisconsin weather. That's an example. We've also seen people do Festschrift or conference collections, kind of gray matter publishing. It's not quite a fully edited collection, but it's something in between. Um, and those are published pretty commonly with Pressbooks. Another uh, use for Pressbooks would be to publish material that's in the public domain. There's a bunch of people that have done literary anthologies. Robin DeRosa has a very famous one for early American literature. Julie Ward at the University of Oklahoma made a really nice one about Hispanic uh, American literature. Anything that's published in the United States before 1923 is now in the public domain. I know Canadian copyright laws differ and the dates are a bit different. You can advise with the librarian there about what's in the public domain. But there's a lot of people making public domain teaching anthologies. Rather than buying an expensive critical edition, they're working with students or they're working with peers and making a free openly licensed anthology of work that's in the public domain already. It's also true for government documents or other material that's meant to be a public service. Pressbooks is a great vehicle for publishing that. And the last kind of big common use would be student or community authored projects. One of the most gratifying projects I ever worked on was a partnership. There's a sector that we call GLAMs sometimes, which are kind of cultural institutions, galleries, libraries, archives, and museums. I think that's the, the, what the acronym stands for. Um, we worked with the local historical museum that was just opening in a small town near Madison. For their first exhibit collection, students and a professor worked to make a, an, an open press book title that covered the library or the um, museum's collection. And then they built a really large ebook accompaniment where they wrote detailed object stories and researched the history and the provenance of these objects. They also included oral history and they included really high quality photographs and made that available for everyone in that local community to understand a bit more of the cultural, her cultural heritage and the kind of folk art behind some of these beloved objects that were featured in the collection. We've also seen Pressbooks used for student writing, for class projects where students co collaboratively build and construct new knowledge and then publish it as an open resource. Or for e-portfolios e where students collecting uh, a set of work that they've done throughout their undergraduate career and presenting it for uh, people to understand more about who they are or potentially for future employers. Because it's open source software and because the content can be exported, students can take it with them after they graduate in a way that isn't always the case for uh, other e-learning tools. So the other thing I want to really emphasize is that when you're going from something, when you're thinking about preparing a print collection, and moving to the web, there are some really exciting ways to go beyond print. Print is great, but there are things you can do on the web that aren't as easy to do with print. One, you can add multimedia, images, audio, video, and really enhance a digital text. The second thing that people have often done would be to add mathematics or formula, sometimes interactive, sometimes it's just displaying mathematical notation using LaTeX and other math rendering uh, options. The third thing is you can add a uh, social annotation, open web annotation. We have an integration with another open source tool called Hypothesis that's really exciting that I'll show a little bit later. And the fourth thing is to add interactive elements. You can have blocks of text followed by interactive components, quizzes, uh, flashcards, uh, interactive video. We support this through Table Press, which allows you to make tables interactive, sortable, and filterable and H5P, a really exciting open source project that we've built an integration for into Pressbooks that we're quite excited about. So those are some common things. I wanna tell a story here quickly of a textbook that we turned from print to digital. I wrote a little bit about this. Um, I've been tweeting about some open access projects that I worked on for Open Education Week, but this is a Portuguese, Brazilian Portuguese language textbook that was initially published in 1963 at the University of Wisconsin. The last major revision you can see was made in 1993. And the problem they had with this textbook was there was no digitally editable copy of this book. 
they'd been using it and teaching it, but it was 20 something years on and they wanted to make revisions, but they, all they had was a scan of the book, digital images made by the library. So they could take that scan and they could print it, but they couldn't actually revise it or edit it any further. Um, some of the problems were like, they were asking students to practice the future tense verbs. And one of the questions this is a famous question. What will you be doing in 1999? It was no longer a future tense question and they needed to revise and keep the content you know, fresh and updated. So what we did was we produced an OCR scan version. We painstakingly brought the text with the help of a lot of graduate students and others in the Portuguese community there. They brought the text into Pressbooks and then a, a really dedicated graduate student named Jared Hendrickson created over 120 interactive components. And they, we, we recorded native Bra uh, Brazilian Portuguese speakers saying a, over a thousand terms in, in audio files in the vocabulary and 30 audio dialogues. And we turned the book into an interactive, openly licensed learning experience. That was a great story. I think a real positive success story and an example of what you can do a, more than more than print with a digital text. Here's some examples of what these interactive content might look like in Pressbooks. This is an example of an audio playlist where you have 12 Portuguese vocabulary words built in a playlist that you could click through. Here's an example of an embedded YouTube video in a Pressbooks content. Here's another example of just a single audio file and then the dialogue, the Portuguese dialogue just beneath it. The other thing that I want to stress is that we want to make it as easy as possible for you to add interactive elements from a wide variety of sources. We support YouTube and Vimeo videos. We also can with you to support if you have a campus streaming media solution that may be um, better for you because it doesn't include commercial advertising. Um, we support things called FET simulations, which are really interesting science simulations. We also support open assessments. Many of these you can just use simply by grabbing the URL and pasting it into the Pressbooks editor. Here's an example. There's a really nice gene expressions interactive activity that was built in this FET simulator. You grab the URL, you paste it into Pressbooks, and there it is as an embedded activity in a Pressbooks book. A similar thing can be done with YouTube and Vimeo videos as I indicated previously. We also wanna make sure that people who are using um, container formats which don't support interactivity, like if you're in a PDF, a print PDF, we, we have graceful fallbacks that show the reader there was an interactive element here. This format can't display it, but if you want to find it, you can visit it on the web at whatever location. So hopefully readers who are not able to experience the full interactive potential can see where they could go to find pieces of content that are missing. That just happens automatically for us in the book. The, um, the next thing to talk about are H5P activities. And it's hard to overemphasize just how much you can do with H5P. As a former instructional designer, I really, really love what H5P is and does. There's a whole huge range of activity types and content types that you can create directly in your Pressbooks dashboard and embed anywhere in your book. Here's the full panoply of types of activities that you can create. There's over 40 of them. H5P was a project that was started and originally funded by the Norwegian government. They wanted to replace a bunch of flash-based interactive content that they realized wouldn't be accessible and wouldn't be, uh, able, you wouldn't be able to use them in the modern web. And so they built a series of HTML5 and JavaScript modules which are accessible from any web browser on the web. And they have these 40-some activity types. These, this is also an open source software project. And the H5P activities themselves can be published on an open license, can be downloaded, can be um, imported easily into any course. And as of our upcoming Pressbooks release, which is in user acceptance testing in the middle of March, we're gonna release it, you'll be able to include these H5P activities when you clone or copy Pressbooks books. I'll show that in a second. Here's what it looks like in your Pressbooks dashboard. You'll see an H5P content dashboard over here. You'll see the ability to add a new activity. Here we're making a multiple choice quiz. Most H5P content types will include a tutorial as well as an example so you can see what one looks like and get some help in, in, in real time as you start to make this activity using the form. And the H5P content itself will also allow you to display an embed button, a copyright button, and a download button which would let others 
um, use this material in an open way if you chose to let them do that. Here's a couple of examples of cool H5P activities that I've seen recently embedded in Pressbooks titles. Um, one of them was created on the left here by Emily Hunt, who's an instructional designer at the University of Indiana. Here's an, uh, it's what's called a um, image hotspot, where she took an image and she's created these hotspot annotations. You click on one and it will pop up. It can display text, another image, video, audio, lots of different things. And so she's annotated her desk saying, here you can learn a lot about who I am from looking at my desk. This is part of a sample e-portfolio. Here, this one on the right is one that I really love. My former graduate student, Naomi Salmon, built this one. This is a set of flashcard quizzes that help introduce people to common flora and fauna in Wisconsin. So you see a picture of this image, you answer what you think the animal is, you can get a little hint if you want, you'll check the answer, it'll tell you whether you're right or wrong, and then it walks you through like a six-part quiz that she built there. There's hundreds, or there's dozens, I shouldn't say hundreds, I mean to be precise, there's dozens of these different interactive content types available for H5P. I see the chat's kind of exploding, is it good for me to take a break and uh, answer any questions about things that I've been going through, or should I just keep proceeding here? Mostly folks just wondering if it'll be recorded. So, um, oh. but it, it's a good Sorry. reminder, ask questions either through chat or unmute. Um, Steele's wonderful, he won't get off track. You can, you can interrupt him and he'll get right back to it. Yeah, um, so that's a little bit about H5P and what interactive content can do for a book. Another really exciting thing that's possible now with the web is what I would call social annotation or open web annotation. We added support for a great third party annotation tool, also open source, called Hypothesis. Hypothesis lets you build a flexible annotation layer or annotation layers that allow really rich public or private social annotation, class discussion, editorial review, or even personal highlighting and marginalia um, in a Pressbooks title. So I want to suggest also that web annotations can be more than text on text. For those of us who grew up like note taking and highlighting, you had a print book and you wrote text or drew doodles or things on the margin of your text. When we think about web annotation, what I wanna suggest is that you can anchor, you can take the whole power of the web and anchor those kinds of web content onto interactive web content. And that's where it gets really exciting. Here's a poem um, that I helped teach about by a beloved Wisconsin poet a favorite of mine. Her name was Lorraine Niedeker. Um, I wrote a big chunk of my dissertation about her, one of my life heroines, and here's a poem, a short poem of hers. What I've done here is I've annotated this poem, and I've used more than just text to annotate it. Here's the hypothesis annotation pane, and here's a sample of a historical marker in Paw Paw, Illinois. She makes reference to Paw Paw, which is both a plant and a place. So here's a picture that's embedded in the annotation layer. Here's a YouTube video about how to serve the pawpaw fruit. Here's a link to a recipe for pawpaw. And here at the bottom is an example of a, an HTML5 audio element that's just been embedded in the player. You can click play on this button and you can listen to Lorraine Niedeker read the poem. All of this lives in the annotation layer. And what's exciting about that is you can imagine that you could do this in a public layer. You can do this in a private layer just for your students or just for your class. You could also set up a private editorial layer where you and other people working on the text can give the text peer review or can make comments or suggestions about what the main body of the text should say. Each of these annotations can be edited if you're the originator of it. They can also be replied to. So you can have what we call social annotation. This particular annotation had three replies and you can see that you could reply to a reply or reply to an original. And what's really cool is that each annotation also has its own stable URL. What's nice about this is, for example, you have a very long textbook and a student comes to you and says, hey, I'm having trouble understanding um, chemical reactions. Previously, you'd be like, oh, well, just look in the, you know, page 37, fourth paragraph or whatever. When you have a large web book, that's a bit harder to do. So you could simply create an annotation with a comment in it and send a student or all of your students, a link to that particular annotation. And when they open that link, it would open up a chapter, that, a copy of that book, and point them directly to the annotation that you made 
anchored at the specific part of the text you want them to pay attention to. That's really valuable and really helpful, I think, for any teacher who's trying to focus student attention in a particular place or give a, a richer, more nuanced understanding of what can be a large and kind of complex text. So that's a bit more about annotation and why we think that's really exciting and what you can do with that in Pressbooks. A very cool feature that we've made possible in Pressbooks, I referenced it earlier, it's called cloning. What cloning means is that any public, openly licensed book on any Pressbooks network, BC campuses, uh, eCampus Ontario, the University of Wisconsin, any of the 40, 50, 100, I don't remember how many institutions we have now using Pressbooks, any one of the, those networks, if they have openly licensed public content, it can be cloned from that network to your own network where you can make local edits and revisions to that content. It works like this. Here's an uh, introduction to sociology text. Oops, that's at the BC campus uh, network. You copy that URL. You notice that this has a CC BY license, which means it can be remixed or cloned. You take it to your network. You enter the URL and you tell it where you want it to live on your network and you click the clone it button. That's really all it is. And then here you have a cloned copy of that book that you can then edit, revise, remix, adapt without destroying or altering the original. We also allow for what's called source comparison. This is a really cool tool that lets you, it'll obviously give a, a link in the metadata to say, this is a cloned book or this book is based on this source and point you back to the source. And it will let you compare differences between your revised text and the live source version. So as an example, in the book information field, you'd see something that looks like this. This book is a cloned version of the source book. So we always wanna give credit when we're cloning and, and making attributions uh, to others. And in the book itself, in Pressbooks, in your theme options, under web options, there's a tool that will let you enable the source comparison. And this will make a visual source comparison possible on individual pieces of content, like chapters or parts or sections. It looks like this. Here's a, a book that I contributed to, uh, talking about making open textbooks with students. Here's my colleague, Anna Andrzejewski. I edited this opening chapter to read a little bit differently. I wanted it to, to read differently. And you can see on the right-hand side in green, the additions that I made. And on the left-hand side, the, in red, the deletions that I made from the original. You can see also that I edited a link down below in the book. And those will be visible at the bottom of the chapter if you turn that tool on. So it helps people compare and see what differences have been made. Can I trust this revision? Do I like the original? Which one would I prefer to rely on or use? The other thing that's possible with Pressbooks is importing content from other sources. If you, don't, if you can find openly licensed content that isn't already in Pressbooks, but does exist in any one of these formats, probably the most common is a Word document, um, you can import it, or I guess EPUBs, you can import it into Pressbooks. We have an import routine, you'd create a new book, you'd come down to this import routine, you'd select the kind of file that it is, and you click upload file and it will take you through a short dialogue that lets you create a book. I made a short video that demonstrates in like two minutes how I imported a novel by Jane Austen that I found on Project Gutenberg and brought it into Pressbooks and then what made it ready for editing or for inclusion in an anthology or whatever I'd want to do with it. We also want, I also want to note, we recently added support for a whole bunch of short codes. What this lets you do is, if you're actually working on or writing a book in Word first or in Google Docs, you can include these little short codes that just say like heading and then a header and a heading, um, or code or other kinds of little short codes, so that when you import the book into Pressbooks, it automatically turns it into the kind of thing that you wanted it to be. It's a nice kind of workflow improvement if you're writing the book elsewhere and then want to bring it into Pressbooks later. So I covered a lot of ground and I tried to do it fairly quickly. What I want to suggest is that each of you, there's lots of places that you can go to learn more or get help. We have a really detailed user guide that's available at this URL. We make a bunch of training videos and publish them to YouTube. They're there here. If there's a topic that you'd like to see covered or that you think should be covered, please suggest it to us. We'd be happy to make it if it'd be useful to others. We have a really nice open source community forum that's available here. People that are Pressbooks users from the open source community talk about things, they ask questions, 
It can get a little bit technical at times, but if that's what you're looking for, there's a technical discussion there. We also try to keep our release plans public. We've published them on GitHub. You can see the kind of ongoing projects we push there. We also have an ideas forum on GitHub where people can make suggestions or recommendations or things they'd like to see Pressbooks do. We try to respond to the community ideas forum and include those in future development. We have an education blog that that, that has a bunch of kind of case studies and feature stories about what people have been using Pressbooks to do at various institutions. We just published one with our friends uh, Rajiv Jandiani at KPU and with Heather Ross at the University of Saskatchewan. So a couple of nice Canadian um, case studies were published recently. Great stuff. So I'm going to take this opportunity to do a final thank you for Steele. Uh, and then also a shameless plug for eCampus Ontario, who launched its open library yesterday. So Lillian and David were at the launch. So that's a great place to go to see some of the wonderful press books that we've migrated from BC, as well as other places and created from educators in Ontario. So make sure to check that out. It does hold um, other OER, it's not just press books but you can certainly see some wonderful examples of Pressbooks in, that, in action from our Ontario folks. So thanks again to Steele. Have a good day, everyone, and happy Open Education Week. Thank you, Peggy. Thanks, Lillian. Thanks, Michelle. Thanks, everyone, for the invitation. Really appreciate talking to you all.